say it's 12 noon here in beautiful what's left of it, Seattle. Actually, Edmonds is, uh, I wish you could look out the window today. It's just 66 degrees. There's a chill in the air. And uh, I see one boat on the sound and hardly any snow left on the Olympic Mountains. It's just a spectacular day here. And I'm sure it is wherever you are too. We're glad that you joined us. This is, uh, I'm George Tolls and this is his deal. For the last 30 some years, we've been a safe gathering place for men get together who are curious about Jesus Christ and what he taught. Uh, there's a verse that has been sticking to me like Velcro the last few days as I, as I uh, join you in being concerned about our city and our cities. Wonder where the protection is coming from. And Proverbs 18.10 uh, is written by King Solomon. Uh, and, Solom and, he, and he writes, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. The name of the Lord, not just his name, but in the Old Testament, the name of the Lord stood for all the character of God, who he is, his, uh, his uh, traits, his omnipotence, his uh, omniscience, his uh, justice, his love, his mercy. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. When we think of who God is and all of his qualities, who's bigger? It's a, it's, it's a strong tower. The righteous run into it. Righteous meaning right with God. And there's only one way to be right with God, and it's not through being good or going to church, uh, although both of those are admirable. But it's through receiving, accepting the gift of forgiveness that God had his son purchase to even the scales so that we could become the sons of God. And uh, that's, the, that's the righteous. So the name of the Lord is a strong tower. His, we can run into his patience, kindness, goodness, uh, and be safe. And I trust that you are experiencing that safety today, a spiritual safety, physical safety, uh, health safety. And uh, if you haven't uh, uh, linked up with God and, and accepted his, his forgiveness, we'll have a chance to do that later in the in the Zoom today. Uh, the Pat O'Day story yesterday was a wonderful one, and uh, Randy Stein, I know you were there and, and others. Uh, so you can, you can catch it on our homepage. It's under uh, Pat O'Day video. I hope you'll have a chance to go watch that. This Zoom session, by the way, is being recorded and will be posted on hisdeal.org under the heading July 2020 videos. Coming attractions, what's up? Uh, Zooming soon to a digital device near you. Uh, the next time we get together will be August 5th, and, and I want you to meet my friend Dan Loney. Dan has been several times to his deal. He is the president of Loney Financial Corporation, one of the six largest financial planning companies in British Columbia. He's one of only 11 members of the Wealth Professional Hall of Fame. He's on the board of directors of Focus on the Family Canada. He, uh, he and his uh, wife, Joy, have... Uh, what is it right now? I think they have uh, 14 children uh, living with them in, a, in an 11 bedroom house up in BC. And they, uh, they have a, an orphanage that they built and sponsored down in Guatemala. It's got a hundred kids going through there. He's just an amazing, amazing guy. And he's, and he's a mentee of, of Bob Beals. And along with him will be Bill Corson, who with his family owned Outdoor Adventure, Center in uh, Index up in the gorgeous uh, Stevens Pass in the Cascade Mountains. And they provide outdoor experiences that are unforgettable. So we'll hear from Dan Loney and Bill Corson on August the 5th. And then on August 26th, wow, Bob Beal himself, our uh, guru, master planner, is going to be with us for a full hour. Um, let's see. Al Doyle. Al Doyle. I'm going to get you on early, Al, so we can get Ready. <clears throat> on early. Uh, I've known Al for, oh my goodness, at least 50 years. We met when he was with uh, David Stern advertising and was doing wonderful commercials. And he would come down to um, KJR where I was working at the time and we'd work on those commercials together. And Al is a brilliant writer. He's uh, a great idea man, a strategist. He's spent most of his years working in advertising in, uh, as it relates to serving the real estate industry. And he's got a new niche now that he wants to tell us about. And I want him to, uh, to tell everybody how you get along with three wives. How's that? Thumbs up. Let's welcome Al Doyle. 
That's a pretty, pretty good build up, George. And I, you know, really, we'll eventually get to the three wives thing, but um, I'll just let your imaginations go wild for a moment. Um, while George is talking about the strong tower and how God is going to cover over us and making things really safe, um, I'm really here today to talk to you about an ambush. I'm talking about um, God's ambush, and basically, if it hasn't happened to you yet, um, keep looking over your shoulder because it just might. Um, you really consider this few next few minutes as kind of a warning, warning of transformation, warning of healing, warning of protection. And I'm warning you because I learned these things the hard way, sometimes the very hardest of ways. Um, God has a way of sneaking up on you when you least expect it, and often when you most need it. Um, I can tell you from experience, if it hasn't happened to you yet, you will be ambushed eventually and maybe often. Um, it turns out that God can be um, creation's greatest shapeshifter. <clears throat> and he comes to us in many, many unexpected forms and definitely in unexpected times. Um, lately, personal pronouns have become have been receiving a lot of attention and, and perhaps have begun to help us better know and understand with whom we're communicating. And for God, I think one of the obvious pronouns is neither he nor she, nor it. I'm wondering if we should really think of God in terms of they. Um, because it really, he did reveal himself as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, so I've kind of the conclusion that God's shape-shifting nature is the reason he was able to sneak up and ambush me. Mm. Um, a number of times. And obviously, as I said before, when I least expected it, but just about always when I most needed it. So I'm a product of Ballard in the 1950s. I grew up in what we used to call Snooze Junction. <laughs> My Ballard playmates had names like Svens and Oates and Olufsen. And of course, the Olsons were one of two kinds. They either were an E. Olson or an O. Olson. And if you were really into Ballard lore, you knew whether that was Norwegian or Swedish. Um, if you had an E, you would be one. If you had an O, you'd be the other. And I'll let you guess what it might be. I'm not going to reveal my potential ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> um, my <clears throat> Ballard playmates' dads were often fishermen, crabmen, maybe worked in the Ballard fishing and crabbing fleets or at the old shingle f mill that used to be right, right there by the um, west side of Ball uh, the north side of Ballard Bridge burned down in the 1958 I think it was and I remember vividly watching watching those flames just shoot high into the air all the way over in West Woodland from our front porch you know probably two miles away that was a pretty spectacular ending. Um, my parents were neither from Norway or Sweden my dad was an English an immigrant from England and my mom was a first generation daughter of a uh, fresh off the boat Sicilian father and a second generation Irish American mother. Um, as a family, our home followed basic Christian values, but we did not go to church and we were definitely not religious. As a family, as a family and as a as a kid, I'd visited church when someone was married or someone died. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably around eight or nine years old that I had this really strong desire to go to church. I think God was calling me. I think I was hearing something that, that um, just wasn't coming from the adults around me or coming from family or neighbors. Um, I really wanted to go to church and I when I look back on this, I see the pattern of God seeking me way more than me seeking God. Um, and little did I know that this was the first installment of his ambush. Around eight or nine years old, I enrolled in some catechism classes at St. Alphonsus Parish over there on 15th Northwest. Um, 
I'd walk from my house in the summer. Uh, my friends thought I was nuts. My parents were a little wondering, <laughs> but it was really important to me. So I, I did this for like three, four years in a row as a, all on my own. Um, I didn't get any discouragement from my family, but I certainly didn't get any push or any encouragement to keep it up. They just thought that was, you know, I wasn't going to get in trouble if I was over in church for a few hours during summer break. Um, and my goal was to get baptized. So after about four years, I keep asking the nuns about when am I going to get baptized? And I would keep getting a lot of, um, well, a lot of loving talk, but never any straight answers. And of course, I wasn't from a Catholic family. I wasn't from a parish family. I don't think they knew what to do with this little heathen guy showing up on their <laughs> first step every, every summer for four years in a row. Um, so the baptism just laid there, never happened. Um, and what brought a major change and kind of broke that pattern is um, I didn't know this at the time, but my parents had a beach lot on Camino Island in the summer of 1954. My dad decided, gave my mom the choice of a, he'd been saving up his allowance from work <laughs> uh, because she handled all the money when he brought home the paycheck, typical of the 1950s. Um, he gave her a choice of a trip to Hawaii for a couple of weeks, or he'd build a cabin on this little lot I didn't know about. And lucky me, because it really did cha change the trajectory of my life in many ways. She chose the cabin. So from 54 on, um, my uh, communion wishes were put on hold and my catechism classes ceased because I started to learn about um, walking in the sand, water skiing, rowing boats, you know, just that became my life. Um, these are the new pa passions that really at that time sh shelved, kind of shelved my yearnings to know, know more about God and to get into his kingdom. And of course, there was no one else providing any kind of influence that direction. Um, and now for the sake, kind of the sake of model, sake of, um, brevity and avoid getting a little too modeling model and i'm going to fast forward over the next few chapters um, i was married to my first wife carol um, shortly out of high school we in my first three years of college we had our two daughters sandra and victoria who are now grown women with families of their own and they live luckily they live close to dorothy and i here in seattle um, um, in both cases, you know, this is an unusual story and this isn't what this is about, but you know, Carol passed away in her early to mid thirties um, when the kids are in high school. I remarried a woman named Jill from who grew up in Tillamook and I met as a client of mine when I worked for David Stern. And we were married um, a few years after Carol passed away and Jill made it, Jill and I were married for about six or well, probably about eight years when she succumbed to breast cancer. So that made me a widow two times. Um, um, part of the, part of what led me to God was, you know, the, this thing that happened to me as a kid kept building and building, you know, it was there in the background, but something I was never really cognizant of until we did, we did move to Bainbridge Island to find a little farmhouse for Jill. And she got sick. And one day when she was laying in bed, um, at, back at home out of the hospital, she was reading the Bible. It was actually one that I stole for her for, from the Swedish hospital. <laughs> so <laughs> I've always said my faith is founded on the stolen Bible, which I'm very proud of. Um, she very sheepishly asked me, um, uh, would you mind if we went to church? Now she was very, very cautious because again, this was not part of my lexicon. This is not part of my lifestyle. This is not part of my life. And church was not, not a thing. And I didn't know about her. She, she went to Sunday school. She went to um, Bible studies through college. But when she got out of college, um, her, her career as a church going young woman passed. So when she's asked me very, very um, um, carefully if I'd be 
okay with her going to church, my immediate reaction is, well, Jill, I'll find you the best goddamn church on Bainbridge Island. Pardon the French, but um, that was that was true. <laughs> and so we did. We found a church. You know, I, I had some friends, and we talked about you know, on the island that went to church. And so I did a little research. I found a church on Bainbridge, and we started going. Um, I wasn't inter I was only interested in taking care of her, making sure that she got what she needed. So we went to church. Of course, that's how foolish and ignorant I was at the time, or naive, I should say, um, not knowing anything about how God works and um, having an awful lot of pride in how I could control my, my own destiny. So we drove to church, second, third time as we drove to church, I happened to mention to her, I think about our third visit, I said, well, this is Communion Sunday. I realized in the pattern that they do this. This is the Sunday they'll do that communion thing where they they pass the grape juice and the it was a wasn't a Catholic church, so we stuck with grape juice, the grape juice and the wafers. And I said, and I, I I've made up my mind. And she was just looking at me like I was a madman because this is you know we had never talked about this. I'm not going to take communion. I just can't do that. I don't believe. I'm just not. I'm, I'm bullet, basically in my head, I was bulletproof. You know, I could go to church, she could get what she needed, nothing was gonna phase me. So we sat down, had a beautiful church service, and like I predicted, they started passing the communion waivers, and like I didn't predict, was when the wafers and the wine hit me, I um, caved like a house of cards. I think that was the next in most serious blow in my ambush. Um, God really caught me off guard and really caught me in need and really spoke to me in a powerful, powerful way and um, absolutely changed my life um, from that point on. I became deeply active in the, slowly became deeply active in the church, became deeply active in the parachurch. Now it occupies a huge part of both my what my life and my wife Dorothy's life. Um, we're active. We're not obsessive, but we're active. And I've created a little business I call Retrofit, which is working with a, a pastor friend of mine in Portland, Dr. Deborah Lloyd. We're um, helping churches find um, ways that their buildings can help support their ministry instead of their ministry always supporting their buildings. Um, there's a lot of problems in church real estate with churches that shrink and massive changes in the neighborhoods around them where property values shoot up and land use changes. And sometimes churches end up in oddball places where they shouldn't be. And, and sometimes they end up fairly empty. So we're going in and counseling them and helping them rediscover their mission, their vision, vision, their values and their passions, and also taking a hard look at how they can, harness their real estate, be it the building or the land or combination of both, um, either through new tenants or even an outright sale, if it comes to that, um, keep making a difference in their neighborhood. So that's, it's exciting work. We've been at it for about a year, year and a half. We, the first year was pretty much us figuring out what we we're gonna do. And now this current year, we've got a couple of really strong clients in Portland that we're working with. and. Very, very excited about the future. So that, my friends, is the cautionary tale of how God can just jump out from nowhere and um, ambush you and change the course of your life. You just, I hope it happens to all of us more often. Al, I'll never forget the day you called me and said, George, I've got a surprise for you. It's one that you've been hoping I'd call you with for a long, long time. And it was right after you'd given your life to Christ. It was wonderful news. Thank you. You were, my, you were my very, very first call, George. Oh, what an honor. I was um, just so, you were, you were present with me in the room when God spoke. Hmm. You're hmm. In, I sat there, and you guys know George. And as I'm weighing this, when I'm finally realizing I'm about to change the life in a way I never expected, I started thinking about people I knew that were um, pretty solidly in the Christian faith. And George 
George was sitting there in the living room with me and I could, and I just said to myself, if I can be anything like George, um, I'll go for it. I'm still working on that part of being anything like George. I'll never be even close, but he was a very, it was a very reassuring image to me that if you become a Christian, you don't have to become a jerk. You can become a really nice guy if you want to be. Well, I don't wish you any success in that, in that endeavor to <laughs> try to be like me, but, uh, but Al, it's wonderful. I love your life. I love you as a friend. And uh, we're so glad you're here today. This is uh, the segment Al just did. I forgot to front announce it as this is your life. Because this is what we do every His Deal. We take 15 minutes and uh, get to know one of the men in some measure of depth. And, and it was great to be with you. Thanks for opening up your life to us today, brother. Well, thanks for listening. Okay. Uh, Jeff and Stacy Kemp have spoken to us here at his deal several times in the past and uh, when we were also known as Nordy's group over at uh, uh, the boardroom at Nordstrom across the street on 6th Avenue and they're just a great couple. We met them for the first time at Pro Athletes Outreach. Uh, we were on the board together and uh, by the way if you've never heard the story of how Stacy and Jeff met. Uh, you've got to hear that sometime. George Bilger knows it very well. He's on a call with us today. He was a roommate and a teammate of Jeff's down with the Rams. And uh, he, he double dated, we found out in the uh, pre-Zoom room. Uh, he double dated with uh, Stacy and, and uh, Jeff for the first time. Okay, so uh, after 11 seasons, Jeff has devoted his time to strengthening families. Uh, here in Seattle and around the country, speaking to large groups of men now, and and uh, Jeff, I feel is the is the right guy to talk to us at this time because the fabric of our nation is really being stretched, I fear, to the breaking point. And Jeff is God's man of the hour to guide us into calmer waters. So please give a thumbs up to the now resident of uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jeff Kemp. Hey, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. After that incredible buildup. <laughs> How's on mute? Does that work better? Uh, that's good. <laughs> I've never known you to be on mute before. Uh, many people would love to have a mute button on Kemp's. It would be a good advantage. <laughs> uh, there's a certain point at which you just need to turn us off. So uh, good to see Jack McMillan and Mike Schindler, a bunch of my buddies, Darren Siedebacher from San Francisco and Dartmouth and Steve Woodworth and uh, Dave Edder, uh, all the good guys. Dave Hood and I had a good talk yesterday. Um, I'm glad George Lilja, my roommate, who cooked the biggest pancakes in history uh, when we were at LA Rams. He cooked a turkey for himself one time and didn't even share it with me because it was Thanksgiving and he wanted to have a turkey. True story. I think I exaggerate a little bit. Um, Roland Roberts out in Florida, and just a bunch of good guys uh, on here. Dave Edder, thanks again for the fishing trip when you and I roomed together. Uh, <laughs> and uh, had a great time with Jan Janura and the wild, wild guys up in Montana. Let me, open up in, yeah, let me open up in prayer. We got a short amount of time, and uh, we want to make sure God gets to talk about what he wants to talk about. Father God, you are an amazing God, and we're in the process of trying to figure that out. Uh, we ask forgiveness and clarity on all the wrong views we've had of you as a dad and uh, the wrong views we've had of you as a savior and the wrong views we've had of ourselves. We do not stand on our, on our own. We didn't invent ourselves. Uh, it's a good thing that you are our father and a perfect one at that. So I pray for your spirit to control me and everything I pray that would agree with your word and that it would point to Jesus. Um, and then every guy here would have the Holy Spirit dominating their listening ears and their listening heart so that they would process whatever you want them to process, hear whatever you want them to hear. And then, of course, unless we act on something, uh, we really won't be changed. So do what you want with this time and be glorified. You're an amazing God. And I thank you for George Tolls. I pray blessings upon Liz, George, their family, his deal, and the role model of pouring yourself out for others. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, 
I'm excited to be with a bunch of Seattle folks, but I'm also with folks from all over the country this week on his deal. Um, just as a quick update, uh, I've been enjoying COVID, if you can believe enjoying it, because all my speeches were canceled, all my travel was canceled, and my son Kyle and Lindsay Ann and their uh, three-year-old son uh, relocated to wherever they could get out of New York City and they lived with us for two months and we've had amazing family time. We had a family reunion during this time. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things I'm learning and I've gotten to grandparent my three-year-old son for two months straight in my home. Uh, it's been phenomenal. So uh, if you're looking for silver linings, God's provided them and he always has, uh, starting with Jesus coming out of the tomb, right? The ultimate silver lining and triumph that came out of a trial. Um, George, can, he throw, can he throw a spiral yet? Uh, yeah, he can, but it's not uh, all that impressive. I'm supposed to love him unconditionally, Dave, so I'm trying not to get <laughs> about that. Um, anyway, I did teach him to jump off a diving board, and he's a maniac, so we're having a good time. <laughs> um, these days, I... Um, have a ministry to men and all those years of marriage and family have uh, kind of pulled me to what I see as the point of the spear that uh, there's a crisis of men's identity and there's a crisis of young men and today we find there's a, a, a suicide and and a confidence crisis of older men and we know it's it's the culture of waking up and finally treating women well but we've gone so overboard we're like you know chucking men off the back of the boat uh, and young boys don't know who they are, and everyone's trying to perform to earn their identity. And, uh, you know, the business world and the sports world and the politics world, the, the church world, if you got a lot of followers, you got a lot of fame, you got a lot of achievement, then that's who you are. And, of course, that's BS. And the enemy wants to convince us that we are the stuff of our lives. And there's a lot of confused guys that are successful and a lot of confused guys that aren't successful. And the solutions to this go right through your dad and the way you were raised. And even if you had a really good dad like I did, they go even deeper and further up to the vertical relationship with your perfect heavenly father. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit is uh, men, our identity, uh, how our leadership and uh, friendship and husbanding and fathering and business leadership kind of flows out of that. Um, and, uh, you know, what Al said, um, that God can jump out of nowhere to ambush you and change the course of your life. I promise you, that is way better than you mapping out your life and asking God to bless it and having it happen that way. He is not our genie. He is not our Santa Claus. Uh, he is not a, a bunch of Bible verses and going to church and avoiding some sins, plug in an equation and get out an outcome. Uh, if that were the case, we wouldn't need Jesus. And we are jacked up, yours truly to begin with. Uh, I don't have time to go through my whole story, but I hope I share some of it. So I'm in ministry to men. It helps me reach men on the husband and marriage level more, which I'm still passionate about marriage. Stacey and I speak at Weekend to Remember for family life around the country. I don't work for them anymore, which is why I moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, but my wife's happy and we love it. It's sunny, we play tennis every morning. Um, it's a pretty good place to live, and we have a, another son who moved down the street and is teaching school here. Um, so it looks like this is, this is where we are for now, and maybe for a long time. Um, so I'm doing speaking retreats, um, ministry to men, and then some soul coaching for CEOs. Uh, I feel like part of my ministry leverages through leaders like Steve Woodworth, who's on this call, Ed McCahill, Ron Blue, uh, guys that want to use their platform um, and let God own it and let it become God's platform and then God's story and then God's resources and then God's marriage and then God's kids and then God's business. Um, it's like the story I heard the other day um, about the, uh, the, the CEO of Krispy Kremes who helped take them through their downfall and bring them back up. And uh, the guy had a spiritual epiphany and he started changing from going to work and dropping his Christianity at home and at church and going to run his life at work. Um, and he realized, no, I need to take Jesus to work with me. And he started taking Jesus to Krispy Kreme's headquarters with him. 
And then he realized, oh, that is so missing it. And he switched and he got to the point where Jesus is taking me to work. This whole building is his, this whole company is his. I myself am his, and he's taking me to his work. That's the spirit with which I want to speak to us today um, about our identity and about our manhood. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions. Um, I'm asking you, are you more or less receiving your identity day by day from God the Father and what Jesus did for you? Or are you still kind of trying to earn it? And I had plenty of years of trying to be the nice, good, positive Christian quarterback, Jack Kemp's son, who could mark out his own niche for himself. Uh, I was still trying to earn my identity, even though I believed in Jesus. Uh, today I'm waking up to the fact that you don't earn your identity. You receive it. And that's a big concept. So that's a question for you. How much are you receiving your identity daily from the perfect father um, who's adopted you and forgiven you and said you're a stud and he really likes you, he doesn't just love you? Or how much are you trying to earn it still? Um, and the other questions are, how much are you listening in life? And these are worth writing, writing down and wrestling with them. How much are you learning, not just about your profession, but how much are you learning about your relationship with this Heavenly Father? How much are you learning about your personality? How much are you learning about your character? How much are you learning about the wrong foundation you built your life on and what Jesus' right foundation is? How much are you learning about how you're pretty weird and your kids think you're weird and you bug them in a bunch of ways? And if you figure that out, you might be able to apologize and change some of it and improve relationships. Same thing with your wife. So how much am I learning? The first question, excuse me, was how much am I listening? Second question is how much am I learning? And the third one I'll talk a lot about is how much am I receiving? Uh, a pass receiver. Let me get a football here for a second. You'll see this football is a little bit Tom Brady inflated level. It's down a few pounds. Um, if I were to catch a, a pass, I'd catch it, but then I might start looking downfield and running with the ball, paying attention to more yards, and some defensive back would come along and swat it out of my hands, and I would, I would no longer be the owner or the receiver of this ball. But if I was going to receive the ball, I would catch it, watch it, tuck it in under my armpit, cover the tip of it with my hand, and I would hold like crazy. And if a bunch of guys like George Lilja, even though he was an offensive lineman, if a bunch of big guys like that came after me, I'd wrap it up with two hands because I want to be the receiver, the protector, the possessor of this ball. And the word receive I'm speaking about that word in relation to all that God is as a dad and all that Jesus is as a savior and all that the Holy Spirit is in terms of being this amazing source that's all over the world and every single one of you guys who believe in Jesus at the same time. How much are you receiving of that Holy Spirit filling? How much are you receiving of that identity of being a beloved son in whom the Father takes pleasure? How much are you receiving the complete forgiveness of Jesus that means I can tell my small group that I was looking at pornography last night, that I had an affair two years ago and I haven't told anyone about it, that I was yelling at my wife two days ago and it was obnoxious, that I've got a huge problem with pride, with ego. I got some secret stuff in my taxes and my finances that I've never confessed to anyone. I got to fix it. I have a huge problem with ambition. I, I, I have a problem with alcohol. I have a problem with pain medication. I have a, a problem with judgment. I have a problem with being super offensible and my skin is so thin that I just get pissed every time anyone says something to me that crosses me. If you know that you're completely forgiven because you've fully received the forgiveness of Jesus, then dudes, you can afford to get vulnerable and honest and say, I got some problems. 
and I need to confess something. But not until you do that, not just to God vertically, but to some other real close friend, are you really going to be set free? Good question is, how much are you receiving? Um, and we'll be talking about receiving your fatherhood from God. Um, I was coming out of church years ago. Kyle, my son, who's living in the house, was 12 years old. His buddy Spencer was with him. And Spencer said, hey, Mr. Kemp, you should hear the funny thing that happened in church. The, the teacher was talking to us in Sunday school about using words to build people up and not tear them down. And she asked for a volunteer. And, and Kyle raised his hand. This is Kyle's my oldest. And uh, she said, Kyle, what do you love to do? And Kyle said, play football. Kyle, imagine this then. Imagine you're playing a game of football, giving it your best, and it's just not going well. You're, you're not doing well, and people are making fun of you. They're criticizing you. They're, they're, they're saying negative things about you. Kyle, if everyone was booing you, how would that make you feel? And Kyle said, like my dad. <laughs> I was happy that he's got a sense of humor, but not so happy about the object. We want to know how are we going to be remembered, right? There's way too much vanity in us. But it isn't wrong to think about how will I be remembered if I think about heaven as my destination and my citizenship, and that there's going to be a paradise with an amazing amount of rewards, and all those talents and joys you have now are going to be magnified, okay? And all the relationships you had on earth either had a positive mark or a negative mark. They either painted a good picture of Jesus or a not so good picture of Jesus. They either wooed someone towards him or they kind of pushed him away. And the things you did to the least of these in terms of the poor and the oppressed and the forgotten and the hurting, you did those unto Jesus. And guess what? He said, I love that. I hope you do stuff that's in secret that no one sees, that blesses people that no one pays attention to because I'll reward you like crazy in heaven. Well, Guess what? Even if not a lot of people give you fame on earth, you will be remembered well if you live like that by the people that matter. And I think I'll be remembered better by Kyle than just the fact that I got booed. Uh, but I do appreciate the sense of humor. Here's a poignant example, though, of a father-son interaction that wasn't so good. I was coaching Little League football. Practice ended. Our boys are like in fifth grade and this heavy set little guy that was on the offensive line and didn't play most of the game like some of the other players, but we coaches had really committed to building up his identity, his confidence, his courage, praising him, coaching him up. And he was a great kid, great attitude. I loved him. Um, some dude, I'm assuming it's a dad or a stepdad, or I don't know, I could have been an uncle or someone. He pulls in the parking lot, instead of getting out of the car and walking onto the field to pat the kids back, toss the football around with them, how was practice like most of the dads? He says, hey, doofus, he yells from the parking lot. Hey, doofus, get over here. Guys, do you feel the visceral anger? I was angry, I didn't go punch the guy, but I told my coaches after that, we got to double down and love this kid because he's not getting it at home. Some of you felt the visceral gut punch of hey doofus because you heard that as a kid, right? You heard it as a junior hire. You heard it in high school. You heard it when you got fired from a job. I heard it when the Seahawks said, I don't want you. Mid-season, 1991, you're cut. I heard it in 1988 when I started one game, played bad against Joe Montana and threw too many interceptions and they benched me and I went from first to third string. They didn't hear from me for four years on the Seahawks. I felt like, hey, doofus. I heard that when the, C when the Eagles cut me. I heard it in fifth grade when I got pinned by my best friend at a wrestling match at my elementary school. Um, and my dad and his all-American Notre Dame wrestling Buffalo Bill teammate, uh, Eddie Rakowski came to watch me and dad loved me and Eddie was positive. But I felt like, hey, doofus, because I wanted to impress them, because I was trying to earn my identity. I'll tell you what, men today feel like, hey, doofus. I quit football in eighth grade because I couldn't be the starting quarterback, and I felt like a doofus. I, that, that time in 88, when I'd, I'd been behind Dave Craig for a year, and then I got the chance to start the next year, and uh, I was good, and I knew how to play well, and I had a great week of practice. 
um, the first pass of the game, I hit Steve Largent in the hands and he dropped it. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. He doesn't do that for Dave Craig, but I didn't worry about it. After that, Steve didn't mess up at all. I did. I sucked. I, I had two interceptions and then a Hail Mary at the end of the half intercepted. And uh, I wasn't doing so well. It made sense to bench me. But the coach completely cut off relationship with me and didn't even talk to me for a month. A guy that had said, Jeff, I've been waiting for the day for you to be the Seahawks quarterback. The tide turned. His view of me changed completely when my performance fell off compared to his hopes and expectations. If we base our identity in how we earn stuff, that's what we subject ourselves to, those volatile definitions. And I would submit that even if you have a lot of success and everyone says, you rock because of what you earn, you rock because of where you go, I see your name in the paper, that can be just as damaging because you will not build a spiritual relationship with your Heavenly Father. And you'll have an arrogance and a pride about you that won't listen to your wife's critique. And you won't listen to your kids because you'll be right. You may not even accept Jesus Christ because you think you got everything you need and you just pretend that you believe in God. So either way you look at it, if you try to earn your identity, you're going to lose. But if yeah, you so let's, take a, let's take a minute and see if, if we got some guys that are that grew up thinking they were doofuses. Let's hear from some of the men here. Do you relate to that? Not Jack McMillan. I mean, his dad called him Hey Stud all the time. <laughs> Listen, as long as you're addressing me, uh, I tell you, I, I spent uh, a lot of years between junior high school, where I had success as an athlete, to high school, where I went in with great expectations of being an athlete and laid so many eggs in my baseball, basketball, and football career that I began to think, how much was I worth? I, I went through that, and uh, I went home one time and told my dad I was quitting, uh, forgotten what sport it was. He said, yeah, that's just like you. And that stuck in my head all these years. That's a false identity that uh, I've been able, just in recent years, to get rid of, Jeff, right wow. in line with what you're saying. Wow. Thanks, Jack. Anyone else have a hey doofus imprint that stuck with them from their dad or from others? Yeah, I, I definitely do. It's actually uh, something that haunted me uh, and, and drove me uh, in, in multiple directions. But um, I was, uh, what's that? Tell us who you are. Uh, Joe Wonkelman, uh, currently a student at UW, former Apache pilot. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I thought I was the dumbest person alive. Um, at the time, I didn't know I was dyslexic. Uh, I went through school uh, uh, very, very uh, bullied um, because I, I was barely passing. Uh, I was told I was stupid by my parents, by my peers, by, you know, teachers loved me, said I had great heart, but I wasn't really intelligent. Um, and, and also really struggled with a lot of identity issues because my dad was bipolar uh, and he would really rage on me uh, if I didn't have the strike, if I threw a ball, it would kill a no, if I threw a ball, it would kill a, a no hitter. Uh, and he would just criticize and condemn me. And I held that so much that I, I threw myself into the military to succeed. And my identity became the Apache, which ultimately, once that unfortunately due to uh, dual kidney failure was taken away, I thought I lost everything. And, uh, you know, as most know that I attempted suicide uh, July 6, 2016. So totally relate. And the, the incredible thing is when you build your identity in Christ, it's amazing the healing that, that, that is accompanied with that. Right on. Jeff, uh, George, I, this is Jim um, Spear. Hey, Jim. Uh, I was called a half ass all my life and that I'd never mount to a hill of beans. And like John, I, it was probably 55, 60 years old when I finally was able to shake that and identify with Christ that I knew Psalm 119, you know, 139, that I was fearfully and wonderfully made, that he's known me from the womb, and I wasn't what I was told. So I tried my whole life to disprove it and wound up proving it in many ways, you know, just like, like it would. But, uh, yeah, that was, that's part of my story. Wow. Hey, Jeff? I can share. Or may I share? Yeah, please. Uh, by the way, I was the MC at Kairos uh, 
years ago when you spoke and I uh, remember I said we both had a background in football and my career started out real slow and fizzled out altogether. Much like, well, never mind. Anyway, uh, I had a very successful father uh, who was a doctor and epidemiologist and I was not scholarly, much more of a kinesthetic learner. And I remember him just saying, you know, Doug, you could always, you know, work for the water department and check meters and be a plumber and nothing wrong with being a plumber or checking meters, but didn't have much hope that I'd go very far at all. And so that took a long time to shake and realize, you know, just because I don't have a college degree or didn't follow his path or become a professional with, you know, like a, like a doctor, um, that I was okay. And I've been spending the last 20 years mentoring executives, which, uh, it's funny too, when I talk to high level executives and go, yeah, I got a two six in high school. <laughs> I've had several of them say, oh, you beat me. Oh yeah. So, so it isn't, you know, what happens then, but boy, we sure hold on to these messages. People say us often trying to help us and right. it's a tough thing to shake. Well, let me take this and make it practical. Uh, there are moments in time where we shift gears, we catch some vision, we make a decision, um, someone says something to us that shifts things, and those are key. But I think every one of you guys know that life doesn't change overall due to miracles. It changes due to habits, which happen in community with a couple friends or a mentor. And it's experience that changed things. Joe didn't become good at military work and piloting in a meeting room, looking at diagrams. He did it. I mean, we used to go on the practice field and have experience. I learned most from throwing interceptions in games that I didn't want to throw again, right? So I want to talk about number one, a moment in time change. And then most of this talk, which George keep cutting in, you know, uh, audibleizing as you did to make sure we get interaction because that was powerful. Uh, I want to talk about the trend, the, the, the ongoing experience of life change around this identity and manhood like Jesus, okay? Uh, first, a quick story. My mentor, Don Wallace, raised two sons and two of their friends didn't have dads raising them, so he raised them too. And Don was a, a construction company guy and he had a... Uh, a home he was building in the San Juan Islands. And he'd hired a heavily tatted up, big bearded, six foot three, uh, brawling, drinking, wild guy that was a kick-ass carpenter. And the guy had been such a good carpenter that Don made him a foreman for the first time on a million dollar home. This is 20 something years ago, so it was probably a, a large home then. Uh, today, garages cost a thousand in Seattle. But this was in the San Juans. And uh, Don flew over to inspect this home that this big burly guy, we'll call him Chuck, I can't remember his name, had finished on time, great quality. Don toured the house with him as the owner of the construction company and uh, proved of everything he saw and kind of Chuck got the confident congratulations that he wanted to get. No, no, but, then, but then Don stuck his hand in Chuck's big burly hand and looked him in the eyes, put his hand on his shoulder and looked up at him and said, Chuck, you're a good man. And this dude started to bawl. Because no one had ever said he was a good man. No one had ever called him out. This was a Gideon moment. Remember, Gideon wasn't a good man or a great general or a great and mighty valiant warrior at age 19 when he was hiding in the wine press. But that's when Jesus came as the angel of the Lord and said, Gideon, the, the Lord is with you, great and valiant warrior, mighty man of God. So God defines you for who you'll be in the future based on what he'll do in you after God interrupts your life, ambushes you, and changes the script, as Al was saying, and gives you credit for the righteousness of Christ. So he can say, I see who you're going to be in heaven, and you're a stud. I love you. Way to go. You're a good man. He says that to about us right now. That's the Gideon moment that a good dad or a good grandpa or a good coach or a good boss knows is needed in the lives of guys like Joe who hadn't heard it, or at the moment when Jack isn't sure, or frankly, all of us. But how about our sons and grandsons? And how about daughters who don't know that their beauty is inside? We need to be the angel speaking that Gideon moment, okay? so. This message today has a point in time aspect that 
you need to know that God is an absolutely magnificent, perfect, amazing, gracious, holy, forgiving dad. He's the dad that jumps off the porch and goes and runs to the prodigal son and welcomes him back and throws a party. He's got the barbecue going. And he still loves his legalistic idiot son that was mad at the younger brother and mad at the dad for grace. He says, dude, everything I have has always been yours too. So some of us run away through legalism and moral perfectionism and trying to toe the line, do the rules, do it right, and earn, it, earn our way to heaven. And that's running away from God. And some of us say, hey, screw all that. Give me the money. I'm going to run and go live at wild. And that's running away from God. The good one about that is sometimes it humbles you faster and you can come back sooner because humility is the whole key. So the point in time when you realize your heavenly father is that amazing dad of the prodigal, and in sacrificing Jesus, he gives all the righteousness of Jesus to you, and it becomes your standing with him. Uh, I want to touch on it real quick. The perfect father, here's Romans 5.8. God demonstrated this perfect love for you in that while you were still messing up, while you're still off the reservation, while you're still prideful and egotistical, Christ died for you. God demonstrates his love for us that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. It's unconditional agape, not an equation that we have something to do with. It's grace. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, at the end of that ambassador for Christ passage, the Bible says, God says, God made Jesus, who never ever sinned, to be the punishment for sin so that we who sinned could become the righteousness of Jesus. So basically, if we put our faith in Jesus, all of us get credit for his life. And he takes the punishment for our life, which pays the price for death. So that's why I say he sees right now who you're going to be in heaven. And he's like stoked about it. And he says, please accept that yourself so you can live into it. Stop living like doofus and start living like mighty valiant warrior. Jack, uh, Jeff, uh, we have a, a gentleman here that I, I think has a, a great bit to add at this point. Uh, Greg Wendelkin has just uh, had a one a come to Jesus moment in his life. It's just a great story, and and Greg, you were uh, you were feeling like a doofus for a lot a lot of years. What's what's recently happened with you? Your get your uh, mute. yeah. There you go, George. Thanks. Yeah. No, I was. Um, I appreciate it. I I actually just I, I got baptized on Monday. And I was baptized uh, uh, at nine months old or 10 months old. But, you know, I, I went through life uh, and, you know, for all the wrong reasons. And, uh, you know, I was working hard and trying to do the best thing for my family, but I didn't have Jesus with me. And, and I remember getting there in my, you know, late 40s. And I was just like, what? This is, this, this is supposed to be the, this is what I've been working so hard for. Uh, why am I so empty? Why am I so unfulfilled? <laughs> I have nothing here. Uh, and so, you know, that was the beginning. Uh, you know, that was the beginning. And I, I lived up on the Sammamish Plateau and I'd go to Eastridge and, and that's how I met George and, and Pat and this group. Uh, and uh, so that was the beginning. That was the beginning of my change. And so I, I we moved to Scottsdale and, and uh, I just told the pastor, I said, you know what, I want to get baptized because it, this time it's going to be my choice. This is what I, this is what I, I need to do. This is the right thing. I need to follow Jesus and, and spread his word. And, and so that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm just so excited about it. And, and uh, I finally, for the first time in my life, feel like I'm on the right, the right road. You know what? And even if you screw up a bunch, uh, his love is unconditional. And he's going to get you to the end of the road. And by choosing to be baptized, you flat out said, I don't have it. He's got it. I'm accepting it. And I'm actually receiving it. So I think jumping in the water is like really grabbing it tight. So that's cool, Greg. And, and I affirm that. Um, and that Gideon moment when God speaks to you or you speak into someone else's life uh, is crucial for us to realize we've got a perfect father. Jesus will accept me just as I am. I don't need to change to come to him. And he now will guide me in a better life than I could guide myself. Right. Frankly, uh, if any of you guys want to learn some cool stuff, call up Steve Woodworth, who's on this call, and say, Steve, let's talk a little bit about 
who owns my life and who owns my business, me or God? Because once you give it to God, and that just doesn't mean you're starting to tithe or you treat your money, it means everything, all the decision-making, all the hopes and dreams and fears belong to him. Uh, when you give him ownership, the whole equation changes. And Galatians 2.20 uh, says that I have been crucified with Jesus Christ, and it's no longer Jeff who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in this body, I don't live on my own. I live by faith in the Son of God. Baptism, and you've gotten that identity, and you're receiving it versus earning it. All right, so those are passages and messages about the one-time receiving of your sonship, your adoption by the Father. The challenge is, we drift back and we forget it and we keep living to earn stuff. I mean, we got all sorts of pastors in America that are trying to earn their Christian cool identity uh, when God doesn't want them to fall into performance mentality either, right? So I want to talk a little bit about uh, a story from Jesus and then some examples of what I'm learning about living this receiving your sonship from God, receiving your identity from God, uh, living as a son every day, receiving your directions, your game plan, your, your, your software, uh, your fuel supply, uh, receiving it all from him every day. That's how Jesus lived. He went to the Father more than any of us, even though he was God already. He listened to the Father more than any of us. He learned from the Father. And then he received the words and the actions. Then he went and did them. And he said, hey, I don't do anything my dad doesn't give me to do. I, I'm, I'm submitting to every one of you guys right now that there's a lot more exciting life ahead of us by receiving our guidance and our life and our identity and our directions and the words we are about to say to our wife or the words we're about to not say to her, uh, the way we're going to react to our, our teenage daughter in this situation what we're going to do about the lost client that was 40% of our business. Are we going to receive God's direction on that and the words he wants you to have talking to that client? Are they going to be about you and your frustration or are they going to be about the kingdom and your grace? We need to receive. So uh, there's a story kind of about uh, just what Al was talking about, changing our plans and our purpose in life by listening, learning and receiving from God. And if that happens, if you receive from God and you let him own you instead of you own it, there's going to be amazing transformation. And the success that happens will be God's, not yours. That's so much cooler to enjoy God's success. Can I get a nod from anyone who's had a lot of success and it doesn't pan out versus God's success in your life is awesome. You, do you agree? It feels, <laughs> way, it feels way different. Okay. John 21, third time Jesus shows up to see his guys. And he's going to see uh, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and two other guys. And you guys know Peter. He was brash. He was a bold leader. Uh, he was probably panicked that Jesus died. And, and, and he wasn't sure if he'd come back, if he was really going to be back for good. And he, their confidence level was probably still a little low. And Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going to call the shots. I'm going to go back to the game plan. And they go fishing. And all night long, they catch what? How much? Yeah. Nothing. And then there's a guy on the beach, and the guy on the beach says, hey, you guys didn't catch anything last night, did you? And they say no, and he says, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll catch fish. And he throws it on the right side of the, 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 the boat, John and these guys, and how many fish did they catch, and how, and how big were they? They were huge. 153. 153 fish. Yeah, this is straight out of John 21, 153 fish. They pulled in the net. It started to sink the boat. John said, that dude on the beach is Jesus. It's the Lord. And Peter changed his plans again, jumps in the water, swims 100 yards, shows up at a coal fire, which is the same type of fire that he denied Jesus in front of back in the courtyard uh, on that terrible night before Jesus was crucified when he said, I don't know the guy. That was a coal fire. Jesus has another coal fire and he's got barbecue and some fish and he's got some bread. And when the guys arrive, Jesus does what all of us men should do. Get some buddies together for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, for a couple beers and a barbecue. Tell your life story. Drop your guard. Do what Jan Hedinga or Jan uh, Janura does up in Montana 
with a uh, great <laughs> fisherman like uh, Dave Etter and me. Um, and do it at your golf club, do it in your backyard, have meals with dudes, drop your guard and tell your sucky, terrible, I got cut by the Seahawks. I never made the team as a junior hire. They called me, hey, doofus. I built my identity on Nordstrom. And that was a lie and it didn't help me. Tell your story. And then ask theirs. And if you read this book by Brene Brown, Daring Greatly, to quote Teddy Roosevelt, far better to dare great things, to win glorious triumphs rather than live in that great twilight. The credit doesn't go to the critic. The credit goes to the guy who's in there, who tries and fails. You will never dare greatly unless you trust God completely and get vulnerable. We got to get vulnerable. We got to take a risk. We got to be honest. What use is it to be fake? I don't want to be liked for my fake self. I want to be liked for my real self. That's why musicians and actors and athletes have a lot of drug, alcohol, divorce, and suicide problems. They are loved for their fake self. Business guys have the same problem these days. We lost a pastor to suicide just a couple months ago, a stud. His identity hadn't been fixed. He hadn't been receiving it every single day from that heavenly father and Jesus. So in that story, Jesus uh, cooks him breakfast and he gives him bread. He gives him fish. Remember, he did that with 5,000 people. He did it with 4,000. Um, and I think that we men need those type of roll up your sleeves, macho brotherhood, fellowship, hospitality, food oriented times. But tell some stories. And then Jesus asked Peter those questions. Do you love me? Three times. And three times Peter says yes, but he's feeling like a piece of dog do. And Jesus comes back and he affirms him and he restores him and says, I want you to tend my sheep. I want you to feed my, feed my lambs, he says. Number one, feed the little babies that barely know anything about me and Jesus. Feed them. And then he says, I want you to feed my sheep. Those who know about me, feed them. And then he says, tend my sheep. Guide them and mentor them and help them and care for them. And he makes Peter into a rock and he restores them triple fold. That's the fathering of God. You're not who you were, you're who he makes you out to be. And in Jesus' baptism, Matthew 3, remember those words? The father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So A, he says, this is my son. B, he says, I love him completely. C, he says, I take pleasure in him. He totally pleases me. Man, what, what kid doesn't want their dad to be pleased with them? And then in the transfiguration, God adds a fourth thing to that. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So he says, this is my son. That's his identity. I'm well pleased with him, which is what every one of us wants to hear. He's beloved, which is his security. God loves him completely. And then he says, listen to him, which, which says, God is saying, this is my Messiah. This is my messenger. This is my ambassador. He's got a role. He's got a place in my kingdom. Listen to him. And I just want to remind you guys that the reason we read the Bible and the reason we go to church, the reason we're in a small group, I hope you have a huddle of two or three closest friends. His deal is great, but you can't talk to 50 guys at once. You need to talk to one or two and go deep and ask the question, what's the most important thing that you need to talk to me about today? What's the most important thing you need to talk to me about? That's what I do in my small group, my huddle. Every week we ask the question, what's the most important thing that you need to talk about today? The reason we do all these things is so that we live from our identity, not for it. Did you hear that? We live from our identity, not for it. We receive our identity. And from that identity comes the fact that he owns us and he's a better owner. And then, like I said, call Steve Woodworth. He doesn't have all the circumstances turn around when he started giving God ownership of his life. But his peace of mind, his relationships with his wife, his daughter, his employees, his friends, his sense of hearing from the Holy Spirit guiding him in business, even if COVID hits and the marketplace goes crazy. This is God's stuff he's managing, not his anymore. All that starts to make sense 
when we accept our identity. And remember guys, this isn't a one-time Gideon principle thing. This is a day-by-day -day receiving principle. Every time Largent caught the ball, he tucked it away and he practiced it every time. So we gotta be practicing this all the time. Are we receiving our identity? Uh, are we listening to God? And are we learning? And I'll kick it up into a couple questions, George, after this. I wanna tell a personal story on the journey to manhood and identity. Most guys have a father wound and a father vacuum. Father wound and a father vacuum. Some dam damage he did to you or something missing. My dad didn't do much wrong to me. He was imperfect and did some other stuff that might not have been great for my mom and others. I didn't know about all that, but uh, he encouraged me to the max. He said, you're going to be a star. He's going to come. I believe in you. You're throwing great. Uh, you look good today. Dad, I didn't even get in the game. Oh, I know. You're, I saw you warming up. You're really throwing well. He would find whatever he could to encourage me. He prayed a blessing over me when I died, and he was in, in cancer's last throws. Dear God, help Jeff know his amazing talent. Help him know the difference he'll make in this world. And help us both remember the only thing that matters is thy will be done. I mean, what dad puts his arm on you when he has cancer and blesses you like that? So I have all this going for me, but even with a good dad, I did not fully receive my identity from the perfect father. There was a father gap in me, just like from the guy who doesn't have a, a dad who, who left or divorced or uh, was mean. Um, and, and the way we fix that father gap is through our own strength or God's strength. And I read this book right here that I recommend to you all. I was in Orange Beach two months ago, two and a half months ago, staying at a rental house that my son from New York City was uh, quarantining in as he, they got out of the city. Uh, Father God, Dare to Draw Near by Dave Patty, a missionary in Eastern Europe. Um, he was leading people to Christ, but found out they didn't understand God because they had bad dads and he had to re father them. And I asked God to refather me during that week. And I read the book and uh, I, I realized that I had built up a lie in my life that present Jeff isn't enough and present circumstances aren't good enough. They got to be better. And the reason I did that is because my dad was so successful. He was running for president at 50. He was the championship quarterback. I was just a Seahawk backup. I built up with this lie that I'm not enough. I need more. And then I built up an idol. My idol was future Jeff, future circumstances. Any of you guys feel like that? You feel like you haven't quite lived up to it all and you're always dreaming about a little bit more? That was my idol. And I, I treated God like the one who, if I served him, he'd serve me to give me that. And that is a utilitarian Santa Claus, false version of Santa Claus of God. <laughs> um, so I had a lie. Present Jeff wasn't good enough. My idol was future Jeff was going to be great, future circumstances. It kind of made me strive hard. And yes, I'd act humble, but it was sometimes acting humble. If you want people to think you're super humble, you're doing it out of pride. So you're jacked up either way. That was a great big lightning that just hit. And then the third thing is I, I realized there was a sin in me of ingratitude and discontentment. I always wanted more. And there was a subtle ingratitude and discontentment. And I think at this age, most of us are realizing gratitude is the most powerful daily attitude to change everything. You take gratitude into your marriage and watch things change. Write a list of 20 amazing things about her. Take, take a list of your son that's bugging you and write 20 things about him or two and start thanking God for them. It'll change things. Uh, Jeff, a few weeks, maybe it was a few months ago, you wrote something about the, the time you learned to compliment Stacy on her uh, appearance when you were taking out for an evening. Uh, well, I, I used to take her to church or to on a date or out to dinner, and I'd come home and tell her, hey, I really like that dress. You look good tonight. And she'd say, that didn't do me any good. You got to tell me before. I want to know that I'm beautiful on the way out. I was insecure I know, all night long. Why did you tell me afterwards? Uh, and I'm just so forgetful and dumb. But I missed the Gideon moment. You know, you don't, you don't tell Gideon he's a stud after they win the battle. You tell him he's a stud before the battle, before, while he's still afraid. So uh, that was one of my many faux pas. Um, 
I, I also took one of my sons, Kyle, on a, on a welcome to manhood 13 year old trip to talk to him about girls, peer pressure, sex, marriage, manhood, life, uh, pornography, all this stuff. We had this big conversation with my wife beforehand. I was going to do all this. And, and we went to Lake Chelan and we did a million fun things. It was so fun. When we came home, she said, how was it? And I said, awesome. And she said, how'd the talks go? And I said, oh, I forgot. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hadn't had a single one of them. I got so carried away as a little boy having fun with my son. Uh, but let me, let me give you this launching pad for more dialogue. I talked about, are you listening? Are you learning? And are you receiving your identity and your directions for life and the powerful life every day from Jesus, every day from this father? It's the receive principle. Jesus didn't do anything that he didn't receive from the father. So in reading this book, I received a healing from that Jack Kemp comparison problem that I had and my ingratitude and the lies that I believed. And I really felt set free. And I, I know that I'm, it's meant to help others. Um, Jim Ebert, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Dude, hello. Yeah. Good to see you. That's my ADD breaking in. Um, Good message, by the way. Good thank message. you. So here, here's what I'm now learning. Recently, um, we had a little family get together, and I, I didn't come in from the beach on time to take our family to dinner to meet the bedtime of the two-and-a-half-year-old. And I'd been specifically requested by my son to come in on time, and I didn't. And I didn't hardly apologize. I figured, hey, it's beach time. Uh, Jimmy Buffett, let's chill. And so I just sloughed it off. And then at dinner, that son said, hey, dad, can you not eat the cornbread for appetizer until the meal comes? Because I don't want my son to want the cornbread ahead of time. Well, I was starving. And pretty soon I just kind of put my shoulder in front of the little boy and kind of snuck the cornbread around the side of the table and started sneaking some cornbread. And I actually had two pieces of cornbread illegally uh, against my son's direct wishes. And uh, after the vacation was over, a few of these incredibly selfish, kind of small things um, had happened. My son says to, to Stacy, mom, I don't get dad. He can read the Bible like an hour a day. That's what you can do in COVID where you don't have any speeches or, or any work. Uh, mm -hmm. He can read the, hour, the, the Bible for an hour a day and it's still all about him. Mm. Right there, my identity, my credibility, and my character was revealed by a mirror. And I had a choice. Would I buck up against it like we typically do? Would I say, wait a minute, I'm unselfish in a ton of big ways. That little stuff doesn't matter, which is my typical approach. Or would I be a listener and a learner who wants God to give me a new message on how to change? And you know what? I, I started in my journal a couple pages of God teach me what's up with this personal convenience selfishness this is it a big problem. And pretty soon I had a whole list of dumb things that I'd let myself slide on into selfishness. And I had one the other day, I, I climbed the pool uh, that the fence to the neighborhood pool so I could take a dip in the pool when they were closed after my mountain bike ride. And by the way, I rode on a mountain bike path that's under construction and it's not legal to ride on it right now, but I snuck in from the woods and then I climbed the fence. I'd warn, I told my wife, I, why, why are you taking a bathing suit? I said, oh, cause I'm gonna jump in the pool. She goes, don't do that. If they catch you, we'll lose our privileges for the whole extended family that's here right now. I can't have that happen. And I still went, went ahead and did it, got in, had my dip. When I came out, the alarm went off and it's starting to send all this noise. And I, I, I read Proverbs 17 that day about integrity. And it started just smash me. My integrity was zero on that, just like with the cornbread. And God has been teaching me that I have excused selfishness in many ways in my life. But the thing I want to tell you isn't that I just found a sin. It's that I called up my son, Kyle, and I apologized to him. And I had the best conversation I've ever had with him. And he immediately forgave me and start apologizing for other stuff. And we went to a much deeper, better level of relationship because I learned that I got some faults and some logs in my eye and I confessed it. 
I even wrote a one-page uh, analysis of Jeff Kemp's personal convenient selfishness, and I apologize to my sons for the way that it's impacted them negatively over the year, and I sent it to all four of my sons. And I am learning, and, I, and my relationship with my sons is getting so better. It's amazing. The best parenting of adult children I've ever done is shutting up, becoming their friend, confessing my sin or my stupid stuff, and telling them the stuff I'm learning about my character flaws and how I was raised and what's going on. We actually just had a family blow up the other day at a family reunion and we called the counselor and we are now having some straightforward, deep, uh, conflict facing, healthy, healing conversations. Everyone needs those. Jeff, we're, uh, we're, we're learning. This is stuff that I couldn't have scripted. It's being received from the father. And if I'm not with the father, my attitude would be, frustrated, point the finger. Uh, so that's how this plays out. Receive your identity and your guidance, your words, your tone, your spirit, your behavior, your business plan, uh, what to do with your money, what to do with your kids, who to apologize to, who to forgive. Receive this stuff from God. He can write the script. Let him own your whole life, not just your assets. Uh, and, and he will write a better game plan. That's what this is all about in terms of being fathered by God. Don't read the Bible like a Christian. Read the Bible like a son, a son going to his dad. Jeff, we need, we need to give these wonderful men some resources. This is, this is solid gold that you've given us today. Where do they go to hear this message? Uh, I, I, I'll throw in a couple. Uh, Robert Morris, the pastor of Gateway Church in uh, Dallas, is doing an incredible job of, of teaching grace, God's grace. PastorRobert.com. Graham Cook is wonderful. He's got many books out. Uh, what, what are some resources, Jeff, where, where, where we can have what you've given us today? Uh, buy, buy, buy this book and give it to friends okay. and process it with two closest friends. I just bought it on your recommendation, and I'm, I'll start it this week. Father God, terrific. And uh, George, let's send everyone the men's huddle dashboard, which is, it's my little uh, game plan tool that I've been using for 15 years with my small huddle of two friends. Uh, we also used to use it at uh, uh, C3 um, with Bob Newber and Jerry Brown and um, Jonathan Sharp and a bunch of guys in Seattle. Uh, it basically has how to set, do an x-ray of your life every week and talk about what's most important. So we'll send that so you can drop the guard and be real with a couple friends. Um, That's called what? It's, it's, oh, it's the men's huddle dashboard. It's a, it's a, it's a digital resource I'll send you. It's going to be okay, a PDF that we'll send through the email list. Okay. And then there's a really good ministry. Um, I, I, I could have told some amazing stories about a guy named Ed Tandy McGlasson who is a friend of George Lilja's, and he played on the Rams, played on the Giants. He was the most evangelistic ambassador for Jesus in the NFL possible. Um, he met Jesus in college when his knee got blown out, and a Christian guy read him John 3.16. He accepted Jesus. The guy prayed for him, and his knee got healed, and he felt God say, uh, you're going to get to play pro football, but I want you to serve me. And he did for five years till his knee got blown out again. And then he became a Southern California pastor, evangelist. Here's the website to write down. Blessing of the Father. Blessing of the Father dot org. It's, it's called Blessing of the Father Ministries. And he's writing a brand new book on identity received from the Father, living from your identity. And there's this phrase of being re-fathered by God. And Ed McGlasson has been getting refathered by God, God for, for the last four, uh, since age 40 because he was raised by a military dad that made it all about performance, even as Christianity was about performance. And at age 40, he quit that and went to grace. And he started receiving everything from the Father. So Blessings of the Father Ministries, uh, his new book and his, his prior book are really good. But let's, and, uh, let's jump in here and hear from uh, a guy who's, I think, got a great story that might relate to what we talked about today, Jeff, please. Rob Samper. Rob, are you in Portland? Take off your, there you go. I am. I'm in Can the you, Rose City. Take about, take about two minutes here. We're running down toward the wire, but take about two minutes and tell us how what Jeff has said today relates to your life. Well, 
Um, again, I'm Rob Stamper. I live in Portland, Oregon, and uh, I grew up with with uh, without much of uh, a real good either father or mother. Um, uh, they, they just didn't treat me very well, so not really good role models. So in the time that my wife and I have been together, we've had three boys together, and one of the big things that I've had pressing on my mind is we always sort of looking for what is our role in this world and uh, the sort of the, what's come to me from God is, you know, you really need to raise strong families, start, start anew and really raise them based on how I guide you. And, and a lot of the things that were being talked about by Jeff, so thank you, Jeff, um, are a lot of the things I'm trying to implement with my own kids. They're in sports and, you know, you start like, started, hey, you could have done this, you could have done this instead of just saying, hey, you did a great job today. And so that whole difference, that whole change that we made in, in how we approach them has been significant. And so I'm hoping and praying that this continues to afford us a great relationship throughout uh, the many years that we will be together. That's great, Rob. Yeah. Um, I, I heard this guy named Bruce Brown from the Northwest one time say that uh, coaches coach, players play, parents cheer know your role Ooh. period that would fix yep, a lot great. of junk parents cheer they need to know that you see them for the future version of themselves not the all-star pitcher that you think they can be or the kid that can get into harvard uh or you know how, how christianly they're behaving uh you they, they need to see that you treat them like that prodigal father's daddy so you're right on it rob Jeff, anyone, else, anyone else have a comment here about um, this ongoing principle of receiving your life from the father because you're receiving your identity from him and he runs the show, not you. Hey Jeff, my name is Kurt Lux and, and thanks for what you had to say today. And what I was thinking about is when I talk to guys, if, if I, put myself out as vulnerable and show them that I can be vulnerable. It makes a safe space for them then to talk about themselves. And so, you know, in order for me to man up, I've got to be humble and dress myself down. And that, that makes for a safe place for someone else then to join in. It's really powerful. Yeah. I, I think if I picked one word that takes all of theology and all of practical psychology and sums up the way God invented things to work, it would be humility. Because if we're humble, we're acknowledging that he's God and we're gonna glorify him, not ourselves. If we're humble, we're gonna be vulnerable and real and transparent. That's what our wife wants. That's what our daughter wants, our son-in-law. Uh, the people on your executive leadership team, they wanna know that you are real and that you're honest and that you're imperfect and that you value them as a person, not just as a cog in the wheel. And I hope you're super smart. I hope you got great strategy. I hope you cast vision like Bill Walsh, who was the best coach and teacher I ever had. But I hope you combine it with humility. You know, that, that's what, uh, um, you know, Jim Collins talked about being absolute crucial aspect of leadership. And uh, uh, Pat Lencioni's, whole philosophies of teamwork and leadership in the advantage and the five dysfunctions of team and the, the, um, the uh, traits of an ultimate team player, humility. And what, what is Philippians chapter two? Have the same humble attitude as Jesus Christ who gave up heaven and didn't try to hold on to his amazing position, but he was born in a manger, misunderstood, endured the worst blitz ever, let everyone misunderstand him, stayed in the grave for three days, let Judas betray him, let Peter deny him. And yet with all of that humility, facing that blitz, it became the victory. So humility is the pathway to everything good of receiving our identity, receiving daily coaching from the father, giving him the credit, which we want God to succeed. You know, enough Christian success. We want God's success by people that are Christians. Jeff, when can the, when can the guys see you next? Where, where are you speaking? As soon as you invite me to 
uh, this high paying gig again. I can't wait, George. <laughs> I'm getting my tax accountant ready uh, right now for the next session. Um, I'm doing a, 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 a prayer breakfast September 3rd in Overland Park, Kansas, and it's going to be virtual. Therefore, it'll be national. So uh, we can get the word out that way. And um, I'm also going to do a, 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 a champion's huddle for Christian CEOs um, and limit it to 11 of us. So that'll be 10 others and myself. And I'll be doing that in September um, to kind of dig into identity as a leader and integrating your faith and your marriage and your parenting with running a company that belongs to God at the end of the day, not you. Um, so that's kind of the next thing. And you asked about resources. I gave you blessing of the father, um, ministries.org. Um, and the Dave Patty book um, is awesome. I really recommend you guys take a peek at this one. Um, unoffendable. Okay, great. We're going to listen to Chris um, Rice right now. And as he sings, would you uh, think about what you've heard from Jeff today? And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, go ahead and give in to him and say yes to him. George, before you let Chris sing, can I pray to wrap this up? Because there are a few thoughts that go. No, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wrap up right after this song. Well, let me pray then after that. Okay. Yeah, you'll pray. Jesus, fly to 
Jesus and live. Jeff, Jeff, pray for us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Great to be with y'all. I'll be on for a couple seconds afterwards if someone wants to just catch up personally. God, you're an amazing father. Please show us more and more how good you are, how perfect you are, how eternal you are, um, how exuberant you are to jump off the porch and welcome us back after we get honest and tell you that we messed up, uh, that you are the perfect father that we all need. Father, thank you that you also are Jesus, the absolute amazing stud that gave his life for us and rose from the dead and reigns eternally. Uh, and we get credit for his righteousness. Help us see that and not beat ourselves up anymore mm -hmm. and not hide or perform anymore, but receive from you. And uh, help us just receive the Holy Spirit's guidance minute to minute. Father, I thank you for these guys. Um, help us to trust in you completely at all times and not lean on our own understanding. Help us to acknowledge you and call on you in every situation and know that you'll direct our path. Help us to uh, write down and, and follow through these questions. Are we receiving or earning our identity? Are we owning our life or are we letting God own our life? Are we listening? Are we learning? And are we receiving? Father, I pray for any guys that don't have two best friends that they can huddle with weekly, uh, by phone, by Zoom, in person, preferably, Lord. Uh, tell them to reach out and create that huddle and drop their guard and tell their story, confess their sin, ask for prayer, pray for another dude, talk about what's most important. May we all be uh, a team as, a bus, as, as opposed to Lone Rangers. Um, and we thank you for our identity in Christ and for having a perfect father. Help us keep receiving it daily. We praise you and we thank you. Um, make, make what you want out of our lives so you succeed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Jeff Kemp, thank you for being with us. And as our friend Ray Brooke demonstrates for us, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. This Good Zoomcast stuff. will be posted on hisdeal.org on our homepage under July 2020 videos. So special thanks to Jeff Kemp today, to Al Doyle, to Walter Powers, to Joe Hinckley. Thanks, thanks Al. Thanks to all of you for being here. May God bless you and keep you until we regroup on August the 5th. Meanwhile, remember this, when it comes to anything and everything, it's all his deal. <laughs>